Hello again. So uh, this time we're going to start looking at Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, now just to clarify something in case there's any confusion, Jeremiah is a very long book. There's a lot of material in there. Uh, we definitely are not going to be working through every single chapter. I'm just going to be going through and uh, touching on ones that I think would be significant and beneficial for a more in-depth look. The goal of working through the text like this is so that you get a chance to see, experience, and, and get a better feel for what a close reading, a detailed analysis looks like. So that's what we're doing as we're going through um, the text, doing you know this sort of close reading like we're doing right now. Okay, so with that, we'll be starting right at the beginning of Jeremiah chapter 2. And I just want to, um, hopefully you catch this, especially if you were paying attention in the previous when we looked at Jeremiah 1. The opening verse here says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Now just that phrase right there, we've seen that before, something very, very similar to that. Uh, we saw it several times in Jeremiah 1. So actually, I want to go back there just so that we can compare and see how this happens. So in Jeremiah 1, I'm just going to scroll down a bit. In verse 4, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying... And then we have this introductory word of the call narrative, uh, Jeremiah's commissioning. And then, uh, let's see, there's some objection, there's some, you know, God's reassuring him. But then in verse 11... We have a similar phrase, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying. Uh, and then down in verse 13, almost identical yet again. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying. And we notice that to show that these are maybe serve as discourse markers to help us um, uh, connect these stories together as part of one, you know, complete uh, like section, uh, you know, all this belongs within, probably belongs within uh, the call narrative of Jeremiah. And then we get down, sorry, I'm just scrolling through here. We get down to chapter 2, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Um, this is deliberately connecting this. Now, Jeremiah is going to be giving a proclamation to Jerusalem, so it's not part of the call narrative. This isn't the word that Jeremiah receives. But uh, many people have taken chapter 2, uh, and sometimes even following from there, maybe even all the way through chapter 6, to be uh, a series of of oracles that have been brought together to serve as kind of an introduct introduction to Jeremiah's prophetic message. Um, all of these just, I mean, there's not a whole lot of very specific historical data. Um, they're a bit more of a generalized. Now, that doesn't mean that he very unlikely would have spoken all of this together. They probably originally existed as separate speeches, prophetic speeches that he would deliver and announce publicly. But they've been brought together and kind of edited, you know, together into one, you know, cohesive literary unit, especially chapter two. Uh, chapter two is probably best understood as a complex covenant lawsuit. So this is that reform form that we learned about uh, in, when we were learning about uh, like form criticism and prophetic speech forms. Um, now, it's not going to follow a very simple outline because it is rather complex, but we'll hopefully try to appreciate some of the, some of the structure of this as we're, as we're working through. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. So verses 1 through 3 are kind of the introduction to this entire complex covenant lawsuit. Um, so we have, okay, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem saying, this is what the Lord says. So uh, there again is uh, that messenger formula. You know, Jeremiah is reminding the people uh, that this, like he is a messenger sent from God. He's been in God's presence. God has commissioned him with a message, and now he's delivering that message as he's received it. So the messenger formula factors very heavily in Jeremiah, probably um, 
I, I'd be curious to just to do a statistical analysis, but probably more in Jeremiah than any other prophetic book, um, you, like percentage-wise, uh, the um, the messenger formula features very heavily. And now he begins this, and there's there's sort of a reminiscing that happens here, and it's it's reminding us of like a honeymoon phase for between God and His people. And God is saying, you know, I remember regarding you the devotion of your youth. Uh, that word devotion is, it's a Hebrew term. It is, oops. Chesed. So written in English. Chesed. So you kind of, you know, it's the guttural sound at the beginning. Um, this is a term that is uh, probably best understood as uh, like covenant loyalty. This is faithfulness. It's very often translated loving kindness, uh, sometimes mercy or unfailing love. Um, this is a very rich, theologically rich term uh, that is being used in, in the context of the Mosaic Covenant. You know, the, this is the covenant that you know, sort of sets the relationship between God and his people, um, you know, Israel is called to have this chesed towards, towards God. Of course, Israel fails in that, uh, but God promises that he will have chesed towards his people. So this devotion, and God's saying, look, I remember you and the, the chesed of your youth when you were young and you were faithful. And, and it's, like it's kind of looking at the past with a bit of of rose colored glasses uh so to speak um which we'll we'll see how that that comes out here and just within this verse okay i remember regarding the devotion the loyalty the faithfulness of your youth uh your love when you were a bride see for the ancient near east um the the term love had a different connotation i'm sure most of you are probably familiar there's there's the modern uh, very western idea of love um that has more to do with like passion and you know uh, sometimes it's almost you know compared to like you know it's the butterflies this this really strong the warm feelings that you have towards another person that concept isn't completely absent i mean of course you read song of songs you, you see that concept within the ancient near east um, but when you see that term love and this you know this one here is um you know this word love is a different word than this word love this is chesed and you can actually see it there highlighted in the um in the hebrew and then this one down here is a hava um this is uh a, a, just a different term for love in this particular case it's a noun although there is a verb form of this a hav uh, but a hava this is meaning um uh, well, it's used very often in the ancient Near East to describe someone who is in uh, covenant loyalty to a suzerain. Like, you know, you have a suzerainty covenant, and you have the great king who's conquered a vassal. There's a number of texts, and there's an article. Uh, I'll see if I can I can post this in the notes. There's an article that explores how this term ahav has been used to describe that it's it's not describing warmth of affection. It's describing covenant faithfulness to the suzerain. And God's saying, that's what you, you were, your love. You had that love. You had that faithfulness when you were a bride. And it says, you're following after me in the wilderness. Um, you know, like, I just, I can't help but think, you know, when you're thinking through, okay, what was Israel's faithfulness what did it look like when they were in the wilderness? And of course, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Moses comes down from the mountain and Aaron has, you know, crafted these these golden calves for the people to worship. So it's not exactly like it's an idealized picture of what their love was like. But that's how it's remembered that they were, you know, they had this this chesed, they had this loyalty to God. Um, and that's what they kind of imagine the the wilderness was like. Israel was holy to the Lord. 
And verse 3, holy to the Lord, the first of his harvest, all who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them. And you know, um, Jeremiah isn't the first to make this, like, have this sort of idealized picture of what the wilderness looked like. Uh, let's see if I can pull up. Um, let's see, it's Hosea chapter 2. Um, I'm going to have to scroll down because it's, it's a ways down. I can't remember what verse number. Okay. So Hosea chapter 2 is a long, uh, again, covenant lawsuit. God has a case against his people, and the prophet's announcing that, and he announces a series of punishments for the people. But then here in verse 14, he says, uh, therefore, I'm going to persuade her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyard from there. And he begins to offer this, you know, very loving, um, you know, description of of how he wants to restore the people. And the place that's going to happen is in the wilderness. Uh, you know, the, it it paints the idea of the wilderness. Very often, the wilderness is um, is a metaphor for being outside of God's will, you know, being away from God. You're, you're cast out from the land, you're in the wilderness, almost like you've left Eden. But then sometimes you have like Hosea and you have Jeremiah in chapter 2, you have the wilderness as not this image of being away from God's presence, but this this place where you actually commune with God. Um, and, you know, it's a very positive thing. So just to, just to note that, these are the kind of details that you'll want to be bringing out in your paper. So, um, okay, Israel was holy to the Lord, verse 3, the first of his harvest. Um, ooh, sorry, my phone started to ring. Um, oh, one second. All right, sorry about that. Okay, um, so you have this reference to... Um, to Israel as as the first fruits, um, you know, the first of his harvest, and this is going back to an idea that comes from from Torah that the first fruits, that's the 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 initial harvest when things just begin to ripen. Um, the the concept was in Israel that that always belonged to God. It was a symbolic gesture. You can read about this in Deuteronomy 26 and Leviticus 23. You know, it's a symbol of how God is the one who's provided for the people. Uh, now, and similarly, not just, you know, so you have the harvest and you have the initial ripened crops. You give that as an offering to God. Um, Israel was considered to be the first of God's harvest, you know, belonged special to God. Of course, Israel is not the only harvest. All those who are, um, you know, other nations, Gentiles have been grafted in, and, you know, I'm mixing metaphors, but you get, you get the idea. Um, similarly, um, you know, children, the firstborn son would be considered, you know, the first fruit of the womb and would be offered to God. Uh, now, for in the case of children, you know, you don't literally offer, as in like do a child sacrifice of your firstborn son. Um, you offer the child, but then you pay a price redeeming that child, you know, purchasing that child back. Which is what kind of makes the the story of Samuel so remarkable, um, because his mother Hannah, if you know the story of of the birth of Samuel, she offers Samuel to the temple, which everyone did. But then instead of purchasing him back, redeeming him back, she said, "No, like this really, this child really is offered to God and for service at the temple." And so he, of course, grew up there and then uh, became um, a very pivotal, significant leader, judge, and prophet for the nation. Um, well, the tribes, I should say, the nation uh, had not quite yet been formed. And then, you know, it says that all who ate of it became guilty. You know, Israel belonged to God. Um, and as God's own possession, God is, he promised that he would protect them. You know, anyone who ate of, of my first fruits, Israel was my chosen people. And if anyone came and tried to eat from of my people, they would become guilty. And that was very common for uh, uh, covenant 
um, sanctions, for the blessings of a covenant, is that the suzerain vowed to protect his vassal. So this, just to make sure that we're clear here, suzerain, um, this equals the great king. Okay, when I say this word suzerain, that's meaning the great king. In the, in the context of the covenant between God and his people, Yahweh is Israel's suzerain. Okay, that's where that language is coming from. Okay, so here's this, this initial introduction. Uh, let's see, and then we have this sort of summoning. Again, I've already uh, alerted you to the fact that this is a a long, complex covenant lawsuit. We have the summoning, um, you know, calling to trial. Hear the word of the Lord, house of Jacob, uh, and all the families of the house of Israel. Now, at this time, Israel was long gone, right? Um... Israel had been defeated. Samaria had been destroyed in 722. So this is a good hundred years before the time of Jeremiah. Um, Israel had been destroyed, you know, exiled, conquered by the Assyrians. Um, But yet Jeremiah is addressing Israel. Um, I think probably, you know, this is, it's a poetic device. It's perhaps serving as this reminder that they're, you know, Israel is God's chosen people, and that's who they are, even though Jeremiah is specifically dealing with the people of Judah. Um, but just just to note that what's going on. But nation here is being called to trial. And then verse 5, he begins, this is what the Lord says. Um, now here he's beginning to give, I think, some evidence Okay, some evidence of, you know, this for this covenant lawsuit. And it begins uh, with this, um, well, first a messenger formula. Uh, this is what the Lord says. Uh, so he begins there. Let's see. Yeah, Ko Amar Adonai. Thus says the Lord. It's, you know, a very, you know, literal translation, Ko Amar Adonai, or Yahweh, um, thus says the Lord. And then he asked this uh, rhetorical question, right? What injustice did your fathers find in me? Um, now you think about what's happening there. When you ask a rhetorical question, um, th- this has, I mean, this is... A, you know, when we talk about rhetoric more generally, you know, how do texts persuade? You know, how, you know, like, texts persuade in some way. This is the basic idea of what rhetoric is all about. Um, how does this persuade? Uh, rhetorical questions invite the reader or the listener, the audience, to supply the answer for themselves. And so it, it like in, almost increases the sort of audience participation that's happening here. So what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness became empty? Well, of course the, the answer is like what injustice is there in God? There's none, right? And so like we naturally are are supplying that answer. There is no injustice in God. But yet apparently According to this verse, they went far from him, and they walked after emptiness and became empty. Now, there's a bit of a a play on words here, and I'm glad this translation kind of preserves it, walking after emptiness and becoming empty. Um, You know, this reflects a biblical principle. Well, sorry, let me first get into what the play on words is. Um, This is a play on the word Havel or Hebel. Um, This is uh, most well known from um, the book of Ecclesiastes. So vanity of vanities, all is vanity or meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. That's the word Havel that's, that's being translated here. The basic sense of Havel is it's like a, it's like a vapor. It's, you know, it's fleeting. It's a vanishing vapor. You know, like when you go outside on a cold morning, 
and your breath, you see your breath, and then it just quickly just fades into nothing. That's Havel. Um, that's the idea. It's 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 a vanity. It's fleeting. It's an emptiness. And here it is. The people are walking after emptiness, and themselves becoming empty. Now this reflects a biblical concept, um, very succinctly stated that uh, we become like what we worship. Okay, this is something that features in um, in idolatry. When we worship idols, we become like idols. This is reflected in a number of places. I think Psalm 115, you know, talks about those who make idols, those who worship them, become like them. Um, and then you also have uh, the same thing happening that when we turn to Christ, when we fix our eyes on him and we worship him, you know, 2 Corinthians 3.18 um, Second Corinthians three eighteen that says that when we with an unveiled face are beholding that image of Christ as in a mirror are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, uh, the the basic principle is that we all worship, we all are worshiping something, and we're becoming more and more like we're being transformed by the object of our worship, and we're becoming more and more like that. Um, so that's a that's a larger biblical concept. It's a fun little twist to play on words. Um, uh, John Bright and his classic anchor Bible commentary he translates this: "Following Lord delusion, deluded they became," um, which I think is a just an interesting kind of turn of, turn of phrase. Okay. So the answer, of course, is none. There's no injustice in God, but yet they they went far from Him and they pursued emptiness. And we'll look, we'll see, um, in just a little bit what that emptiness looks like. <clears throat> and then it continues. Uh, they did not say, "Where is the Lord?" So there is not that questioning. Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed, and where no person lived? So there's no seeking of God. The people were not seeking God. Um, so failure to ascribe to Him. The, the recognition that he deserves. You know, the God, he's the one who brought them up from Egypt. He's the one who's, who's led them. Um, it has been speculated, that phrase, where is the Lord? Uh, perhaps Jeremiah was giving this section of the prophecy. Um, perhaps it was at a time of a, a public uh, festival or celebration or a public liturgy, where perhaps the you know, that question, where is the Lord, um, was maybe being asked as a, as a part of this public liturgy. Uh, it's just purely speculative, but it's kind of an interesting thought, because we'll see that phrase, how it's repeated again. Um, you know, in verse 7, you know, God's recounting his blessings for the people. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat of its fruit and its good things, but you came, you defiled the land, you made my inheritance a, an abomination. And then it continues. So you have the blessing of the land. Uh, that's one of the significant blessings um, in, the Old in the Old Testament. And here it's it's been defiled. It's It's been made into an abomination. Um, and then the priest did not say, there's that question again, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers revolted against me. Prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that were of no benefit. So, I mean, we have like four different groups here. We have the priests, uh, those who handle the law. That's the lawyers, you know, the scribes. You have the rulers and you have the prophets. Um, now, all four of these are going to become regular targets for Jeremiah and also will become regular opponents of him, and they'll be opposing him. And here he's, you know, he's calling each one of these out, okay? So this is all evidence of how, you know, you, you guys, you didn't ask, you didn't seek after me, um, you didn't say, where is the Lord? You know, what injustice did I do to you? Of course, none but yet you didn't seek me. Okay, and then we get into verse 9. Okay, so therefore 
I will still contend with you, declares the Lord, and I will contend with your sons' sons. Now that word contend, this is that reeb. Okay, it looks like it looks like this. The the B sound is sometimes pronounced like a V. Sometimes it's pronounced like a hard B. So that's if you're wondering why I'm pronouncing it the way that I am, um, I can't get into explaining when's the difference or why you pronounce it some way, sometimes a certain way and sometimes another. It's kind of like the, the English letter C. Sometimes it's an S sound like center, and sometimes it's a hard K sound like cook. Um, Hebrew just is like that sometimes. So you have the reed form. This is the word that is translated as contend. So it's occurring there, and it's occurring there. This is highlighting for us. I mean, this is alerting us to this is a uh, more technical language. Uh, it's a technical term for a lawsuit. The covenant stipulations have been broken, and that's what we're dealing with here. So this is the this is the read. This is the accusation here. Um, so you'll notice that the evidence here or the, sorry, the structure of this covenant lawsuit, I've already said this, but worth saying again, the structure of this covenant lawsuit is not um, like the so-called typical structure, if you can really say that. This is uh, it's a complex thing. I don't think this all existed as one single covenant lawsuit. I think that you know, a lot of different separate speeches have been brought together to form this one complex uh, literary unit. Okay? So God is announcing, he, this is his accusation, he has a case against his people. Okay, and now he begins giving some more evidence. He says, cross over to the coastlands of Kittim and see and send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there's been anything like this. So the, these two places are mentioned, Kittim, uh, this is a Phoenician colony on the island of Cyprus. So Cyprus is out in the Mediterranean. This would be west of, uh, of Israel. So an island way out to the west, um, not a place that they would have traveled to or anything, uh, but just known as a far western place. Um, and so just referring to the island of Cyprus. And then you have Kedar, which is uh, referring to an Arab tribe of nomads. And so they would have lived uh, far to the east of the land of Israel, um, out in the desert. Um, that's who that's referring to. And so t you take these together. He's saying, go off and you know look as far as the west and the east and see if anything has been done like this. So the, the idea is that your transgression here is abnormal. Not even other nations do what you have done. You know, you're supposed to be my chosen people, and you're acting like worse than what they have done. We'll see exactly how that, how that looks. Um, it's worth noting that not long after this time, something very similar did happen. Um, there was a leader of the Babylonian Empire. His name was Nabonidus. Uh, Nabonidus was uh, the last leader of the Babylonian Empire. And he tried to, he had some, some different uh, theological ideas. So Marduk was the chief, the national god of the Babylonians. And he kind of went off south he left the city of babylon was working on the rebuilding of the great ziggurat of ur um, this large stepped pyramid type structure and he was uh kind of elevating the moon god whose name was sin above the level of marduk and for the people of of babylon that was like a heretical thing to do because babylon was the national god um he was not viewed very kindly for this and actually um there's some indication that when the babylonians were finally conquered by cyrus when cyrus came in that many people were welcoming him not as a conqueror but someone who because cyrus came in and said marduk has Sent me. He has given me command of your city, and the people accepted. Yes, you know this is he's not he's not Babylonian. He's he's Persian, but he um, you know he he understands like he's at least 
let you know saying that we should worship Marduk first. Um, and so it was you know this was a very big deal for a people to change their so-called national god. Now for Israel, Yahweh was their national god. That's you know how he was conceived for the people. Um, now of course he should have been the only god that they worshipped, um, but they would have viewed you know Yahweh you know when you pit Israel against Babylon, it would be Yahweh against Marduk. It's it's the national gods um, who would fight on their behalf. So um, he's saying, you know, this is an abnormal thing. In verse 11, we see what that looks like. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have exchanged their glory for that which is of no benefit. Okay, so here we have... Um, you know, God saying, you know, has anything happened? Like, look as far as the east and the west, has anything like this happened? Um, but my people, you have traded me. I'm supposed to be your national God, and yet you've tried to uh, replace me. Um, other nations are at least faithful to their gods, <laughs> and they're not even real gods. Um so, yeah, that's kind of what's going on here. Okay, verse verse 12, Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder. Be very desolate, uh, declares the Lord. Um, so, uh, God is, is tur- you know, turning, he's addressing the heavens. Um, heaven and earth would have been witnesses of the covenant. We already looked at that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, I think verse 26. We already saw how, you know, heaven and earth is a witness to the covenant. And now God turns to address heaven. You know, he says, be appalled at this. You know, shudder, be, you know, and be desolate. You know, consider the gravity of the situation. It says, for my people have committed two evils. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters to carve out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that don't hold any water. So now he's moving into more evidence again uh, in verse 13. This is evidence of, you know, God has accusation. He has a, a case against his people, and here's what they've done. He's spelling it out for them. They've abandoned God, a uh, fountain of living water. Now, in Jerusalem, there's kind of a, a very vivid picture of this because Jerusalem is all, you know, all the water in Jerusalem comes from the Gihon Spring, um, which would, you know, so it supplied the water. The, and actually, that was how David accessed the city of Jerusalem. When he first invaded and captured the city of Jerusalem, he went down through you know, the, the the tunnel where the spring was and came up, was able to come up inside the city walls to be able to take the city. Um, and God is kind of a picture of that. You know, the Gihon Spring is a picture of God who's providing that life-giving water source. Now, this is saying they've abandoned, you know, me, my provision to be, you know, this life-giving water source. And instead, they've carved out for themselves these cisterns. Now, a cistern is kind of like a well. Um, it'd be like a large reservoir built to store rainwater, really, is what it was. Um, so to, you could use that rainwater when the dry season came. Um, also, it could be used to store grain. If, if it's needed here in this reference, it certainly is talking about water. Um, so carved out of limestone bedrock. Um, sometimes you can adapt it from a cave formation, um, but built in the ground, and then you would plaster it with lime to make it watertight. And so these were shaped. Later, we'll see how Jeremiah was actually thrown into a cistern. But these are shaped, you know, you have the ground up here, and shaped kind of like that, or you could have them shaped, almost bell-shaped like that, um, was kind of the the way these cisterns looked. Um, but yeah, and God says that they've carved and they've rejected, you know, him as the fountain of living waters, the Gihon spring for the people, and they instead they carve out these cisterns, but they're broken. They don't even hold water. Um, this is what they've what they've done. All right, and then let's see, continuing down um, in verses 14 and following. So is Israel a slave 
Or is he a servant born in the home? Why has he become plunder? Okay, so Israel as a slave. Um, to whom was Israel a slave? You, of course, you have Israel was a slave to Egypt, very literally, but we can even think uh, not during the time of, um, you know, when, you know, prior to the Exodus, but we could even think more recently. So during the life of Jeremiah, um, Israel was a vassal of Assyria. And then after that, you know, when Josiah went to try to cut off the Egyptians, but died in that attempt, if you remember that in, from the historical context, uh, Egypt took control, and Israel was then, or we should properly say Judah, was then a vassal of Egypt. So under both of these powers, um, you know, this is a long time, you know, since the time of, of Isaiah, um, Israel had been living under the shadow of Assyria. Um, so now he's saying, okay, um, why has he become plunder? And then here in verse 15, the young lions have roared at him. They have roared loudly. They have made his lands a waste. His cities have been destroyed without inhabitants. This reference to young lions, this would be a reference to Assyria. The might of Assyria was often compared with lions. Um, that was a common thing. We even looked at the, um, at the, the relief of, of Ashurbanipal, Assyrian king, the last of the great Assyrian kings, um, and depicted in the lion fights, where or, you know the lion hunts, I should say, where he was hunting the lions. So, you know, here this connection is made, and then verse sixteen. Also, the men of Memphis and uh, Tapenes have shaved your head. So, men of Memphis. Whoops, men of Memphis. This is, of course, this is not. Not Memphis, Tennessee. This is uh, Memphis and Egypt, and so the men, you know, they've shaved your head. This the shaving of the head was kind of um, something that we you would do when you would conquer a people, a nation. You'd conquer. You would shave their head as you would take them, march them into exile. It's a, it's a humiliation thing um, that would happen. And then, okay, now we get to another rhetorical question: Have you not done this to yourself? By abandoning the Lord your God. So you've been oppressed. You've become a, like a slave to Assyria and then Egypt and, you know, just other nations. You know, God promises that he would protect his people. He would keep them, you know, safe and free and, you know, provide for them. But they have to live up to their stipulation. And he says, look, you've been a slave to Assyria, to Egypt. You've done it to yourself. Haven't you done it to yourself by abandoning Yahweh, your God, when he led you. Um, but now, in uh, verse, verse uh, 18, now what you are doing on the road to Egypt, uh, what are you doing on the road to Egypt except to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what are you doing on the road to Assyria except to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Okay, remember, God is their source of water. God himself is that Gihon spring in Jerusalem, providing all the water that they need. But now it says, look, you're going off to Egypt to drink from the waters of the, of the Nile. In other words, you're looking to them to provide for you. You know, that's what a vassal would do. Or on the road to Assyria, um, looking to drink from the waters of the Euphrates. So again, looking for, you know, to someone else to provide that sustenance, that life that they need. And remember, when you have stipulations, what is the, what is the heart of all the stipulations? What's the heart of the commandments that God has given to his people Israel? It's exclusive loyalty to God and God alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I mean, it's that exclusive chesed, that exclusive devotion, faithful, covenant faithfulness, covenant loyalty that Israel's supposed to have to God. But now he's, he's calling him out. He says, look, you're, you're looking to other sources. Okay. And then uh, continuing um, 
In verse 19, your own wickedness will correct you, your apostasies will punish you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to abandon the Lord your God. Uh, and f- the fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of armies. So again, we have that messenger formula kind of wrapping up this uh, this brief section here uh, within chapter 2. That, that's the, uh, the messenger formula. Okay. So, uh, long ago, I broke your yoke and tore off your restraints. But you said, I will not serve. And uh, for on every high hill and under every leafy tree, you have lain down as a prostitute. Okay, so um, some concepts happening here. First, you know, he says, on, on every high hill and under every leafy tree. This is... Um, you know, what's happening there is these are places of Canaanite idolatry. Canaanites practiced idolatry on on forested hilltops. Um, you know, that was, you know, on the high places, so to, so to speak. That was a place for Canaanite idolatry, and this is mentioned a number of times. Uh, I think you can see it in the book of Hosea. He kind of describes this as a location for idolatry, and it says they have lain down as a prostitute. Um, this is specifically, when it says lay down as a prostitute, it's not saying literally. Uh, prostitution um, is used, employed very frequently by the prophets as a metaphor for idolatry. Um, that was the idea. So a prostitute would be someone who is um, unfaithful, you know, to, you know, they should have a spouse and they should, you know, be in this exclusive relationship. But it's a symbol of unfaithfulness in in that context. Um, and Israel is acting like that because they're supposed to be, you know, much like Hosea's, you know, the prostitution that he's dealing with. Um, God is supposed, they're supposed to be completely loyal to God. Remember that devotion of their youth, but yet they lay down like a prostitute. So they're, they're sleeping around, so to speak. Um, with Canaanite idolatry, um, temple prostitution was a, a prominent feature of Canaanite idolatry. So perhaps, you know, that there's a bit of that connotation, the sort of a double, double entendre that would be, you know, evidence within this text, you know, quite literally laying down with prostitutes, acting as a prostitute, laying down with temple prostitutes. Um, But then we continue along, verse 21, I planted you as a choice vine. This is a very clear reference now to Isaiah chapter 5, the so-called song of the vineyard. Um, You know, God plants his his people as a choice vine. so here he's recalling that. Jeremiah is drawing on the works of other prophets who've, who've come before him. Um, a completely faithful seed. How then have you turned yourself before me into the degenerate shoots of a foreign nation? Sorry. Um, of a fo- sorry, of a foreign vine. Sorry. Um, so God planted you as a choice vine, a good vine. Like, a, you you want to plant a vineyard, you want to start with, like, some really good quality vine that you're going to plant and, and hopefully grow that into a large vineyard. And God took, like, the best of the best and planted his, his people, faithful seed, but yet they have turned into the de- degenerate shoots of a foreign vine, like a weed. Um, although you wash yourself with lye, and use much soap. The stain of your guilt is before me, declares the Lord. So you you try, but you can't get yourself clean. Okay. Now, within this complex covenant lawsuit is, um, I think, another form. So we're dealing with covenant lawsuit, but then here within verses 23 through 28, we have, I believe, a disputation. A disputation. This is that uh, prophetic speech form that's kind of like an argument. It's borrowed from the wisdom tradition. Um, And here, uh, 
Jeremiah is sort of representing the people. He says, how can you say, I am not defiled? I have not gone after the ball. So they're maintaining their innocence. He says, you know, you're trying, you know, you can imagine Jeremiah is giving this prophecy and the people saying, we're not defiled. Like, you know, he just accused them of this. We've not gone after the Baals. And he says, how can you say this? And then he begins to explain. He says, look at your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift young camel running about senselessly on her ways. Um and gets even more, a wild donkey accustomed to the wilderness that sniffs the wind in her passion. Who can turn her away in her mating season? None who seek her will grow weary in her month. They will find her. So you're like, you're like an animal in heat. Like, how can you say that you're innocent? Like, you'll worship anything that will give you, you know, that you think is, you know, worth your time. Um, you know, you're, he says, you know, you are guilty of this and here's the proof you're like this animal in heat um let's see keep going uh keep your feet from being bare and your throat from thirst but you said it is hopeless no for i have loved foreign strangers and walked after them and then okay like the shame of a thief when he is discovered so the house of israel is shame so now like you've been like this animal in heat and you've you've committed idolatry and now you're ashamed of being discovered they their kings their leaders the priests and their prophets oh we have these groups again you know all these people you know slightly different here but you know jeremiah is highlighting these these different groups um who say to a tree man he's really giving it to him here say to a tree you are my father and a stone you gave me birth for they have turned their backs to me and not their faces um but in the time of their trouble, they will say, "Arise and save us." So this is what they're doing. They're they're looking worship. You know the trees. They're talk. He's talking about idols carved from wood and stones. He's talking about idols carved from stone. And when they're in trouble, you know they're supposed to call out to Yahweh, but instead they're calling out to these worthless idols, saying, "Arise, save us." And then in verse 28, kind of wrapping up this little mini disputation. But where are your gods, which you have made for yourself? You know, you're calling to them to save you. Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble. For as many as the number of your cities are your gods, Judah. So here's, he's maintaining this, you know, this little dispute, the accusation of the dispute, that you've gone after the Baals. You've worshipped other gods. You've... um, You've committed idolatry. And he says, you have so many idols. You have as many idols as you have cities, um, is what he's saying to the people. And then verse 29, let's see, he brings it back to the covenant lawsuit. Why do you contend with me? You have all revolted against me, declares the Lord. So he's bringing it back as that reeve term again, reminding us we're in this covenant lawsuit, and they're trying to defend themselves. <laughs> like... Normally in the covenant lawsuit, you're just supposed to, you know, the people should just be quiet and take it and repent. But yet when they're in this covenant lawsuit, they're actually trying to argue and declare that they're innocent. You know, Jeremiah turns again, notice that messenger formula features so heavily in in Jeremiah. Okay, let's see. Okay, in vain I have struck your sons, they did not accept discipline. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. So God has corrected them. He's been sending prophets, he's sent nations, you know, who've invaded, who've, you know, taken control, oppressed the people as punishment, and God's saying, I have you know, I've struck your sons, but you didn't accept my discipline. Um, you've, I've given you these opportunities to change, but you still keep persisting in this. Uh, your generation, look uh, to, sorry, let me scroll this up. Your generation, look to the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to, uh, to Israel or a land of thick darkness? Why do my people say, we are free to roam? We will no longer come to you. Um, 
no, God's saying he's he's accessible. He's he's not been like a will, you know, off in the wilderness somewhere that you have to journey to him, or he's not like, you know, clouded in this darkness. Um, but yet you're acting like I'm not even here. You act like, you know, you're just free to do whatever you want. I'm, I'm right here. Um, can a virgin forget her jewelry or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. So is this idea, you know, you, your transgression is abnormal. You know, how do you, you know, if a bride, she's not going to forget her wedding dress and just, you know, walk down in her jeans. Um, no, of course she's going to know that. Uh, but yet you've forgotten me. How well you prepare your way to seek love. Therefore, even to the wicked woman, you have taught your ways. Um, also on your skirts is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor. You did not find them breaking in. But in spite of all these things, you said, I am innocent. Surely his anger is turned from me. Behold, I will enter into judgment with you. Because you say I have not sinned, okay. So they're they're trying to maintain their innocence. We've ca- of course have in verse uh, thirty four um, the lifeblood of the innocent poor. So there's, I mean, they have been oppressing the poor. This is a big thing. It's not just idolatry. It's also this you know flagrant oppression of the poor that God cares deeply for. Um, you know, they, they weren't like breaking into your house, but yet you've you've been oppressing them. And you try to maintain that you are innocent, even still. Okay. And now, let's see, verse 35, he finally begins to announce, okay, I will enter into judgment with you. Okay, God is, he's going to be judging his people. And then verse 36 why do you go around so much uh, changing your way? Also, you will be put to shame by Egypt, just as you were put to shame by Assyria. So this particular bit here, this dates this, um, you know, perhaps just before the death of Josiah, when when Egypt is going to um, take control of the land and, and make them a vassal, and some people are going to be exiled, Um you know, Jehoahaz, the king, he's going to be exiled, taken to uh, eventually to Egypt to die there. Um, he's saying, look, you are going to be put to shame by Egypt, just like it happened with Assyria. If you know the history, you know how Assyria has been oppressing you, that same thing is going to happen. For from, from this place as well, you will go out with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected those in whom you trust, and you will not prosper with them. So this this prediction, you know, you'll go out with your hands on your head. I mean, eventually there's defeat and there's exile coming. This is not the big exile. This is a smaller one. Okay. All right. There's a lot that we kind of skimmed over, but hopefully this is a good introduction to, um, you know, a very substantive chapter of Jeremiah's prophecy, his words to the nations. So, Enjoy.